Welcome back. It is time we learn in details what is information gathering and how can we perform it. We already know that information gathering is the first step in penetration testing and it is an act of gathering data about our target. It can be any type of data that we might find useful for the future attack. And if you remember, there are two types of information gathering. We got active information gathering and passive information gathering. And we talked briefly about them, but now it is time to fully explain what both of them are. So let's start with active information gathering. In active information gathering, we use our Cal Linux machine and we try to get as much data or as much information about our target while interacting with them. It could be a target website that we need to test, so we need to find as many things about it as we can. Or it could also be a network that we are testing, or perhaps an entire company. The main point is that with active information gathering, we directly get that data from the target. This could mean directly exchanging packets with the target by visiting and enumerating their website, or it could also mean talking to an employee that works there. We could maybe call them over mobile phone to try to get them to tell us something important, but this part is also considered social engineering. Nonetheless, any action where you exchange something with the target is active information gathering. This can be legal to an extent. If you start performing some advanced scans or OS fingerprinting on the target, you most likely won't get in trouble, but you should still not do it without permission. And it is important to mention that usually active information gathering will provide us with much more important data than passive information gathering since we are directly interacting with the target. On the other hand, we got passive information gathering. And it is similar, we got our Cal Linux machine and our target. But we also have an intermediate system or what I like to call a middle source. And what this middle source is, well, basically it could be anything from a search engine to a website it could also be a person, but what matters is that information we get is going through that middle source. For example, if we want to find out something about a certain target and we Google that target to find some pages that contain information about it, this is considered passive information gathering. Okay, good, but what are the goals of this? What exactly are we searching for? Which information could be of value? To us. Usually the first thing we search to identify a target is their IP address or IP addresses if the target has multiple addresses that belong to them. This could be for example a company that has servers and buildings all around the world and if we were to test this company we would also be interested in their employees too. For example we would want to gather their emails which could be useful for a future attack to gain access to that company, or we could possibly want to gather their phone numbers, which could also be useful. But most importantly, and what we're mainly interested in, are technologies that the target has. If it was a company, we would want to know how many networks they have, what softwares are running on their machines, what operating systems they have. If it was a website, we would also want to know how that website was built, which programming languages it has, does it have JavaScript or PHP for example, just one software on one machine that is outdated or that has a known vulnerability that could be exploited is our way in. So, now that we know what we are looking for during this first step, it is time we see what tools and programs can we use to find out as much information as possible about our target. Let's do it. Welcome back. Since this is our first video in information gathering, we're going to start off with something easy. Let us see how we can identify our target and get its IP address. We're going to check how we can do this both actively and passively. 
let's do it with active information gathering first. So this means we're going to interact with our target. So just go on Google and pick a website that you want to use for this. It can be any website that you want and you can also use the ones that I will show in this video. First open up your terminal and what we're going to do for the first test I'm going to use this website. This is just some university page that I picked and what we can do to get its IP address is to ping it. Most of you will already be familiar with ping tool since it is installed by default on any operating system. By pinging this website or any other website we're sending something called ICMP packets to that website and if we get responses back that means that website is up and running. But what we also get besides that response is the IP address. So let's try it out. I will leave this link right here and I will just add at the beginning ping space and then hit enter. And it seems that we are not getting any responses back but what we did get is an IP address. Here it is. And we are not getting responses back from this site because it is probably blocking ping probes which some websites often do. Let us try another site to see how it looks once we get responses back. So to stop this you can simply just press Ctrl C and it will tell us 32 packets transmitted and 100% packet loss. Now this doesn't mean that this website is offline since if we visited this link right here or this IP address we would open a page to that website. But just in case let us see how it looks like once we get the response back from the ping command. If I try to ping a big website for example like Facebook, so let's type ping facebook.com. Here we get an IP address of Facebook and we can control C since we can notice that we are getting packets back which means Facebook is up and running and also responding to our ICMP packets. Just to note this IP address right here is just one of the IP addresses that Facebook uses. So for you once you ping it you will probably get a different result. Okay what we saw right here is an example of active information gathering to get the IP address since we directly send packets to these websites. Another tool you can use to get IP from a website is called NSLOOKUP. So if I go down here and type NSLOOKUP and then the name of the website which in our case let's try with the first one which is this one and once again you can test any website you want with this, it doesn't matter. If I press enter it will give me this response which says server and address right here. But this is not the IP address of this website, this is just my router and where the result or where the IP address of this website is, is down here. Here it is. If we compare this one and we go back to the ping command you will notice the IP address is the same. So we got the same result, which is good. Let's try the same with Facebook, so just type right here nslookup facebook.com and we also get the IP address of Facebook. Now, if you wanted to do this passively, you would search for this information, such as IP address, over some other website. Let us see how we can do that. First of all we want to open our Firefox and to do that just click on this Cal Linux icon in the top left corner and type Firefox. You should see Firefox ECR, click on it and what we're going to look for is a website that provides us with IP address of a different website. And since I don't know any website that does that I will simply just go right here in the search bar and type what is an IP address of this website? If I press enter it should probably give me a few results of different websites that will do exactly what we want, which is get the IP address of another website. And let's go with this one, IP checker, which is ipinfo.info. If I click on it 
and down here we see something that says IP domain checker. We need to specify the IP address, the domain or URL. And if we type the domain name of that first website, so if I type the same domain name and click right here on check. Okay, so some security checked. Select all traffic lights. Let's select all traffic lights that we see. And here is the result. And you will notice that right here we get even more information than we asked for. For example, here is the IP address of this website. We also get from which country it is, as it says right here in the brackets. And we also get its geolocation, which says even the city. We can also check it out on Google Maps if we wanted to. Down here we get even more information such as reverse DNS. Here we get information about registration date, modification date, expiration date. Down here we get some of the DNS servers. And here we get its physical address. So this is the exact location to where this server is located. Now this is just the same result I believe. Down here we also get some email addresses as we can notice right here. All of this could be useful for us depending on which type of attack we would plan. Now of course we are not going to be attacking this website since we do not have permission but we are simply just gathering information to see what can we retrieve from the internet about this website. And for now on we are getting a bunch of information about it. Now similar response that we got right here we can get using a tool called Whois. Whois not only gives us an IP address of the specified domain but it also gives us a bunch of other information about that domain. It is already installed in Kali Linux so let's test it out. If I close this page and type in my terminal Whois the same domain name press enter I will pretty much get the same information that I saw previously on that website. As we can see right here, we get those DNS servers, the registration date, modification date, expiration date, we get the physical address, and some other things such as ID number, tax ID, which is not really of interest to us. And let us also test this tool on Facebook, since different websites might give different information. For example, if I do the same on Facebook, since it being a much bigger site, it will probably give us much more information as well. So let's type it. Who is Facebook.com. Press enter. Let me just enlarge the terminal so we can see everything clearly. And if I scroll all the way up, we get some name servers. Tech street, city, state province, postal code. We also get some phone numbers right here. Here are some of the email addresses for the tech email. So we get another email address right here and even more phone numbers. We get the city, the street. If I go all the way up, we can see that this is a who is response. So this all information is public to us. And this would be pretty much it. This is all the information we get for Facebook using Whois tool. And by the way, in real penetration tests that you will perform, all of the interesting information is something that you want to write down in a report. For now, we only saw how we can get basic information such as IP addresses, country origin, physical address and similar. But later during information gathering and scanning, we might find something that shouldn't be out there on the internet and that would be called information disclosure. It is something that client doesn't want to be seen, but it is still publicly available. So anything that you might think is interesting, you would write down. Okay, great. Now we know how we can identify a target by getting its IP address and also getting its physical address and some other interesting information as well. And even though this isn't really hard information to get, it is a good beginning. Let us see in the next video what else can we find out. Welcome back. Now we are going to discuss a tool called WhatWeb. This tool is used to gather information and to scan any website on the internet. So it is primarily used to scan websites, 
since this tool recognizes web technologies including web servers, embedded devices, JavaScript libraries and many more things. They explain it really well on the website page for this tool. So we can read right here about all of the details that this tool has. We can notice they have over 1700 plugins, each one of them used to recognize something different. So they use these plugins to perform the scan on the website and discover what technologies does that website run. And what is important for us is this second paragraph, since down here it tells us that default level of aggression called stealthy is the fastest and requires only one HTTP request of a website. Now what this simply means is that this WhatWeb tool has different levels for scanning. And the default level is the level of aggression that is called stealthy, which we can use on any website that we want. The other levels of scanning are more aggressive and should only be performed during penetration tests. So we should not use the more aggressive scans on the websites that we do not have permission to scan. We can however use the stealthy scan on any website that we want on the internet. And don't worry, we are going to see all of these options in just a second. For now, it's good that we know what we can or cannot do. So let's test this tool out in our Cal Linux. To do it, open up your terminal. And to check out all of the options we can do with WhatWeb, you can simply just type WhatWeb in your terminal and press enter. This will give you a smaller help menu with some of the basic features that WhatWeb has. As we can see, we can specify targets, which can be anything from URLs, host names or IP addresses. Here is that aggression level, which we specify like this. There is the aggression level 1, which is stealthy, and the aggression level 3, which is aggressive. The default level is level 1, which is good to notice, so we don't want to change this if we scan a random website on the internet. We can also list all of the plugins that it uses but we are not currently interested in this. And we can have also a verbose output. But these are just some of the options for the WhatWeb tool. To get even more available options with WhatWeb, we can type the command WhatWeb dash dash help. Press enter and this will give us a much larger help menu with all of the possible options that we can use for WhatWeb. And down here, here is the aggression level, we can see besides the stealthy that we are going to use on random websites, and besides the aggressive scan that you would use in a penetration test, there is even more aggressive scan called heavy, and it says right here, makes a lot of HTTP requests per target, URLs from all plugins are attempted. So this is basically the deepest scan that what web tool can perform on a website. Up here are also the targets, so we specify a target first. And if I go all the way down, you will notice right here we got some of the examples of usage of WhatWeb. So we can see right here that the most simple example is running WhatWeb and then the domain name. So for the first run, let us go with this one. We're only going to specify website as an option. So just type down here WhatWeb. And since we're using the aggression level 1, we can scan any website that we want. So I'm going to go with this one. And this is just another university website from my country. Feel free to scan any website that you want or you can also go with this one if you'd like. If I press here enter, in just a few seconds we should get response for this website. And here it is, we already got something. Uh, we got two responses as we can see by the links right here. The command has finished executing so let us just go through these results and see what we got. It tells us that it most likely performed a redirect as soon as we tried getting this link. We can also see that we got the Apache web server. We even get the version which is 2.4.6. We got some cookies right here which the website uses. We got from which country it is. Which type of HTTP server it uses. If I go down here, here is the IP address of this website. Here is the PHP version that they use. And the redirect location, if you remember I told you that it most likely redirected us to a different page, here is to where it redirected us. And 
Once we got redirected, we got the response of 200 OK. And this is just an HTTP response code, which tells us that we successfully loaded a page. We got the same Apache version, the bootstrap version, which cookies it uses. Down here we got the country. And we also managed to extract some of the emails. As we can see down here, these are some of the emails from the page that belong to this domain. Down here we also see that it uses HTML5, which HTTP server it has, which Apache version it has, once again which PHP version, the IP address, it also uses jQuery, Lightbox, and a bunch of other things we can see right here. But I don't really like how this is outputted. It is hard to read. To output this a little bit prettier, we can use this verbose option that I saw in the help menu. Here it is. And what this verbose option does is it also includes plugin descriptions. It will also tell us for each plugin that the WhatWeb tool managed to discover, it will tell us what exactly that plugin is. So let's try it out. If I type WhatWeb and then the same website, but I add dash V option at the end and press enter, it will pretty much give us the same result, just it will be outputted a whole lot better and easier to read. If I scroll all the way up to the beginning of the command, here is where it starts. Whoops, it doesn't start here. Here is where it starts. If I go all the way up, remember we got two responses. Here is the IP address and this is the first request or first response which tells us to move to the actual website, so the redirect response. We get all of this information that we got previously, but we also get this section right here which says detected plugins. And for example, if we didn't know what Apache was, we could read right here what Apache is. And down here we get the version that this website has of the Apache. We also get for cookies, same thing. For HTTP server, we can see which operating system, which Apache server it is, which PHP version it is. It tells us right here what PHP is, for example, if we didn't know. PHP is a widely used general purpose scripting language. Redirect location. So after this request, it redirects us to this location. And down here, we get the response 200 for the actual page. We get once again the country, the IP address, and all of the detected plugins. And we can read through this and discover what is this website running. And it is outputted a whole lot better and easier to read than the previous command. Okay, good. So we managed to get the information as to what a certain website is running, which technologies it has. And in the next video, we're going to deeply go into this tool and try to perform some of the more aggressive scans as well as experiment with some of the different options of WhatWeb as well. Welcome back. Let's continue with our WhatWeb tool. So in the previous video, we only saw how we can perform the basic stealthy scan on a certain website. Another thing that we can do with WhatWeb besides testing a website is to test a range of IP addresses all at once. So if I open up my terminal and I type WhatWeb, dash dash help once again to list out all of the available options and scroll all the way up. Here under the targets we can see that we can specify URLs, host names, IP addresses, but we can also specify IP ranges. We can specify them like this or like this. Now to test this out I'm going to scan my entire home network and to know what range of IP addresses should I scan for my home network? I could type down here command I've config or sudo I've config since remember this requires root privileges. Press enter, enter our password, and we can see that my IP address is 192.168.1.4. And what's more important than the IP address in this case is the netmask. And my netmask is 255.255.255.0. The subnet mask right here means that only the last octet of my IP address is changeable 
which is this last number. So these first three octets or these first three numbers never change in my home network. This also means that the range of IP addresses that belong to my network are going to be from 0 to 255. So basically the range of the IP addresses that my network can have is this one, 192.168.1.0 to 192.168.1.255. This is the range of my home network. So let me scan it. Now, for you, it might be different based on what type of network you got, but in most home networks the subnet mask is going to be this one. Therefore, just the last octet will be changeable for you. Now, before I actually run the scan, I don't have any websites hosted in my home network. But I do got some devices running something on port 80, and port 80 is an HTTP port that websites use to host their pages, so we should still get some result from scanning my network. Let us go delete this and type whatweb and then the range of my home network. Let us go with 1 to 192.168.1.255. So this is the range of IP addresses that I want to scan and all of them belong to my home network. And the good thing right here is that I can use whichever aggression level I want since it is my own network. Let's test out aggression level 3. To do that we can specify dash dash aggression and then 3. After it we can also specify the dash V option to better output all of this and let's press enter. You will notice we are getting some of the results but there is a lot of this error happening on the screen. Now what this error right here is, let me just control C since we are not going to wait for this to finish and what this error is is all of the hosts that it tried to scan but couldn't manage to. And the reason why it couldn't manage to scan these hosts is because they do not exist. I currently only have around 2 or 3 devices on my home network and all of these other IP addresses are out of use. So let me go up here to see what it found. It found the result for the IP address 192.168.1.1 and this is my router. Down here we can see all of the plugins that it managed to detect for my router. We can see an interesting plugin which is password field. This is something that we would write down since any password field that we find we can use later on in something like a brute force attack to try to guess the password and try to brute force the login credentials. But nonetheless this is just a router so we are not really interested in it at the moment. This is just an example of a test of how it would look like. And since I don't have any website on my home network, it didn't really give much result. We can see right here, here is another IP address that is active. It is 192.168.1.10 and this is an IP address of my laptop, which is currently up and running. It detected this HTTP server on it, but it got the status code of 403 forbidden. So it is not allowed to visit that page. Therefore, this is as much information as it managed to get. And all the other ones down here are simply just offline. Now if you don't want this outputted, this red text, you can use the same command and at the end add dash dash no errors. What this no errors option does is it simply just doesn't print these offline IP addresses. Let's test it out. If I run the same command just with no errors, you will see we are not going to get any red text anymore, it will only scan these two live IP addresses which is my home router and the laptop and that is basically it, that is everything that it will output. Ok so it took just a few seconds to finish and keep in mind that since we are running level 3 of aggression scan, it will take a little bit more time to scan something than with level 1, since it is performing a deeper scan than just the level 1 stealthy scan. Ok, so we ran this command and we used the aggression level 3, we used dash v to output all of the detected plugins as well as their description and we used no errors to not print out these offline IP addresses. 
But what if we, for example, wanted to save this output that we got in a file for some future references? Well, if I type the command whatweb dash dash help and I go through this help menu once again, I will get to this part which is logging. And down here we can see that there are a bunch of options that we can use to log our file or to save our file. So let's just go with the first one. Or we can even use the second one, which is to log verbose output. To do that, we use this option right here and then equals and then the file name that we want it to save to. So if I go down here and another useful command, once you have a bunch of things happening in your terminal, and by bunch of things I mean just a bunch of text printed out, what we can do to get rid of this is run the command clear. This will clear our terminal so we get much cleaner look. Now if I press upper arrow to find the command that we ran previously and at the end I add log and then dash verbose equals and here I can call the file results for example. If I press here enter, now you will notice that besides of this outputting it to the terminal, it will also save it inside of a file. Let's wait for this to finish to check out the file that we got. Okay, so it finished. Let us clear the screen once again. And if I type ls right here, we will see our results file. Let's lower the terminal and open this file to see what it got saved. And if I enlarge it, we will see that we got our results saved for both IP addresses for my laptop IP address and for my router IP address. Now, for your scan, if you scanned your home network, you will probably have more devices or less devices, or you might not get any result in case none of your devices is having an open port 80, or in case none of your devices is running an HTTP server. So don't worry if you didn't get any device. This is just an example to see that we can even run the ranges of IP addresses and to test out this aggression level 3 scan, since we can only do it on the websites that we own or have permission to scan. Okay, great, so look at all of the commands that we crafted with all of these options right here. And this is just a part of this WhatWeb tool. You don't need to be learning all of these commands. You can always just run the help command and read through its help menu to discover what you want to run. Now, we won't be going through all of these options in WhatWeb Tool since there is too much of them, but I encourage you to play with it a little bit and see if it has any other interesting options. Great! In the next video, we're going to see how we can harvest or gather as much emails as possible from just knowing a domain. See you there! Right now, we are going to see how we can gather emails for a certain company or a domain. Remember, people are always weak at security. If we manage to send some malicious program to someone working in a company and they run that program, we got our way in. We can also use emails in something like a brute force attack. We can use them in the username fields. There are many ways this could be useful, but for now, let us just see how we can get them. Since emails are public information, we can test this on any domain we want. And to get emails, we're going to check out two different options. A tool called the Harvester, that's installed in Cal Linux, and a website called Hunter.io. Let's start with Harvester first. So open up your terminal. And to just run the help menu from the Harvester, we can type the tool name. So just type the Harvester with capital H and press enter. And this will output us with a smaller help menu, just like the WhatWeb tool did once we specified its name. We get its banner and some of the options that we can run. It tells us since we try to run it with just the name of the program that there is an error, the following arguments are required. So we need to specify the domain. But before we specify the domain, let us just run the bigger help menu so we can see all of our available options. Okay, great, here it is. So we get the 
domain option. So we need to specify either a company name or domain name to search. This is the limit, limit of search results, which is default equal to 500. And all these other options are not really of interest to us besides this last source option. And this last source option we specify with dash B and we specify where we want to search for emails. Now we can either specify one of these. We can, for example, specify we want to search for Twitter, LinkedIn, Bing, Google, or we can simply just specify all and it will go through all of these in search for usernames, hosts, and emails. So let's try it out. If I clear the screen, type the harvester. And first thing we need to specify is dash D for the domain. And for this test, I will go with this domain right here, which is another university domain. You can go either with this one or you can pick any website that you want and use it instead. So if I specify the harvester dash D, then the domain name, the next option that I want to specify is dash B. And remember, dash B option is the source. So where we want to search for the emails, host names and usernames. And let us for the first try specify all. And the last option is dash L, which is the limit that is set by default to be 500. So we can either specify more than that or less than that, or we can simply just not specify dash L at all. And it will just by default scan 500 results. So if we leave it just like this and I press here enter, the running of this command will take some time. It will search for different results. It will search for host names. It will search for usernames and it will also search for emails. As we can see down here, it says searching 300 results and this will go up to 500 since we are using the default dash L option, which is 500 results. And it seems that we already got some users found. Here are some of the names as well as what do they do. So this is already some result for us. Let's just wait for all of this to finish and then we will go through all of the results that we managed to gather. Okay, so it has finished. Let us check out what we got as an output. So it searched through a bunch of different platforms as we can see LinkedIn, VirusTotal, Yahoo, Twitter, but it didn't manage to find any results for these platforms. The only thing we got is these users right here. But this is not what we looked for. We wanted to find some email addresses or perhaps some usernames. There is one thing with this harvester tool. From my personal experience, this tool doesn't always work. There are days when it gives amazing result, but there are days when it doesn't find any emails or any hosts, just like it did in this case. As it says, fail to detect a valid IP address from this domain name. We also didn't get any emails. And I'm talking about scanning this same domain just on two different days. That's why it is always good to, in case you don't get any results for this tool right now, to scan it multiple times. So if I scan it once again, and instead of dash B all, I will select dash B and scan only from Google to see if I get any different results. And if we still don't manage to get any results, just try the same command either later or tomorrow. And I guarantee you, it will usually give you a different result. As we can see, we didn't manage to find anything with this tool. That's why we got a second option. And that second option is a website hunter.io. So let's go and visit that website, open up your Firefox, And in the search bar up here, type hunter.io. It will automatically lead you to this website. And we can see right here, we got this search bar where we specify a company domain and we click on find email addresses. But on this website, you must first create an account. And you either have a free account or a paid account. Technically, you can even search without creating an account, but it will only show you first five results and they will be half blurred. Let me show you. If I go here and type the same domain name that we used for Harvester. And let me just enlarge this a little bit so you can see in greater detail. 
and I click on find email addresses, it will show me first 5 results and they will all be blurred. Now you can technically try to figure out what these email addresses are, but they will be blurred nonetheless. And down here it also tells you how much results it managed to gather. It managed to gather 315 more results besides these 5 emails and those results will be available if you get a paid account. With free account however, let me show you how free account looks like. If I go in sign in and I sign in to my account, for you just go and create an account right here and sign in into your free account. Once you create an account, you should be able to have about 50 searches per month with a free account, as it says right here, so we got 0 out of 50. And these monthly requests reset in about 1 month. And as I mentioned, even with free account you also don't get all the results outputted, but at least the emails that it gives you are not blurred. Let's test it out. If I type the domain name that we used this entire video and click on search, right now I managed to get some of the results right here. So I get up to 10 results with its email addresses and with their names. So we got the name and we also got the email addresses. We get right here which pattern it used to find email addresses. And all of these email addresses are also split into different sections. So if I click on IT engineering, I will even get what type of work does this person do. Project advisor, IT engineering, production engineering, technical editor, as well as their email addresses. We also get from which sources we managed to get these emails. And if I go to all right here and I remove this IT engineering, down here we will also get that there are 310 more results for this domain name. So it is completely up to you whether you think you should get paid version for this. Just keep in mind that with the paid version you get much more results than with the free version. The bad side about the paid version is that it isn't cheap at all. If I go to my account, up here and I click on subscription, I can see down here which plan choices I have available to purchase. And you can see 1000 requests per month will be around 50 euros per month. So this is completely up to you. But nonetheless, what we did learn in this video is different ways to gather emails about a certain domain. And I encourage you to also later try out this harvester tool once again because it does know to give really good results once it works. And one more thing is that at the end of this section I will give you a tool that is coded in Python 3 that will be able to gather even more emails from a specified domain. So it will be even better than these two options that I showed you right here and it will be our own tool. I will give you its code and also show you how to run it and how it works. Okay good. In the next video we're going to see how we can install some additional tools that we might need for information gathering. See you there. Okay, so for now we took a look at a couple of tools used for information gathering, but what happens if some of the tools stop working? Or if they get outdated? What are we going to do? We cannot depend on certain tools. If a tool breaks, we must find our way around to do the task either using other tool or by creating that tool ourselves. Well, luckily, there are a lot of tools available for us to download online. And we cannot cover all of them, but what is important to cover is how we can download them. So, in this video, we're going to be searching for an information gathering tool that we can download online and then run in Kali Linux. And the best place where we can find those to download is GitHub. Most of you, if you are either a developer or a programmer, are already familiar with GitHub and for those of you who don't know what GitHub is, GitHub is the world's largest community of developers that build and share their software. So let's see how we can download some additional tools from there. First of all, open up your Firefox and when we download tools, we either know exactly which tools we want to download so we search them by their name, or we have no idea what tools even exist. And this is the case where we don't even know what we want. 
We only know that we're looking for a tool used for information gathering. So let's just type that. In search bar, type information gathering tools GitHub. Up here, information gathering tools GitHub. Press enter. Okay, so let's just click and go with the first link. Information gathering tools. Make sure that it is from the GitHub page. And down here it will output us with a bunch of different tools that are used for information gathering. As we can see in the description, scan all possible TLDs for a given domain name, information gathering, website reconnaissance. This is a program to detect probability of admin page. And uh, we got a bunch of different tools. If we go to some other links, we will also see some other tools available. So from the second link, we get the Sherlock, the Photon, F Society, and Testing Bible. If I go all the way down, here is the Harvester. Remember this tool we used in the previous video. And by the way, if you didn't test out once again whether you managed to get some of the results with it, try it out right now. And down here, we will get Discover, which is also a known tool, Raccoon, Striker, Red Hawk, Sandmap, and a bunch of others as well. And let's just go with any one of them. Let's just go with this one. Let us read the description. It says, all-in-one tool for information gathering, vulnerability scanning, and crawling. A must tool have for all penetration testers. Okay, so it seems interesting. Let us click on it. Click on Red Hawk. And here is the page of the tool. These are all of the files that the tool has. We can see them right here. Down here we got README. This is what we can perform with Red Hawk. So we can read what are our available options with it. And down here, released versions, change log. Down here we also get how we can install it, how to configure it, and we get usage. Now, sometimes you will need to install some of the requirements that the tool needs in order to run. And you can almost always find the commands that you must run on this tool page. So, as we can see right here, we got the usage and installation, so all we need to do is follow both of them. And different tools might need different requirements, but this is something that you will get better at the more tools you install. However, to just download a tool from GitHub, you will always use the same command and for this command what we need to do is we need to copy the link to this tool. So copy up here this link, right click copy, let us lower this page and open our terminal and the command is git clone and by the way make sure that you're in the slash desktop directory before you run this then type git clone space and then paste the link and press enter. And this is the command that we use to download a tool from GitHub. As we can see right here, it downloaded all of the files and right now on our desktop, we got the folder called Redhawk, which is our tool. And also keep in mind that sometimes once you're searching for a tool, you might need to download multiple different tools before you run into a good one. So let's test this Redhawk tool out. Let's see whether it is any good. To run it, well, we don't know how to run it, but we can go to the Red Hawk directory and see what files we got right here. So we got some PHP configuration files, functions, PHP, these are all of the files that we really are not interested in at the moment. If there was, for example, a usage file, we would most likely want to read that in case the tool is complicated. But for now, we got this redhawk.php file. And out of all of these files, this is the file that seems to be the tool. So how can we run this? Well, first we notice what type of file it is. It is a PHP file. So to run it, we must type PHP and then the file name. If it was, for example, a Python file, we would type Python and then the file name. So depending on which file type it is, we run it like this. So PHP redhawk.php and press enter. It will load this with its banner and it tells us right here that some of the modules are missing and it tells us that we can try fix command or we can simply just install it ourselves using terminal. So let's see whether this tool will install it for us. If I type fix, 
checking if curl module is installed, curl module not installed, and installing curl operation requires sudo permission, so you might be asked for password. This asks us for sudo password, and let's input it. And it seems to be downloading the curl module for us automatically, and we don't need to run other commands. It is also installing the second thing that I'm missing, so let's just wait for this to finish. And it tells us right here, job finished successfully, please restart Red Hawk. So let's clear the screen and run once again PHP Red Hawk, and right now we don't get any error messages right here. It only asks us which website we want to scan. So let's just go with Google, why not? Let's see what are the available options that we have. Enter 1 for HTTP or enter 2 for HTTPS, and since Google is HTTPS, of course, we will select 2. And here are all of the available options that we can use with our Red Hawk. Basic Recon, Site Title, IP Address, Cloud Threat Detection. So let's see just the Basic Recon of Google. If I type number 0, it should perform the Basic Recon. And here are some of the basic output for Google. So we got Site Title to be Google, IP address, web server, Cloudflare, and it seems to be stuck at Cloudflare, so let's just control C it, it could be just a bug, and let's run it once again, type google.com, type 24 HTTPS, and let's go once again with zero, just to see whether it will perform it correctly right now. And never mind, it seems to be stuck at Cloudflare once again, so let's just go with other options and test them out. Now this is what I'm talking about, maybe if you don't like this tool, maybe you want to consider going and finding some other one, but for now we only tested one of the options, so let's go with other ones as well and see what else can we get. The who is lookup, let's go with that one. And we get the who is response for our Google. Good, so this option seems to work. It tells us scanning complete, press enter to continue, so let's continue and let's go with geo IP lookup. This should tell us the coordinates of the Google and it does tell us, it also tells us the country, the IP address, the latitude and longitude, but city and state seems to be unavailable. Let's go with another option, we got grab banners, DNS lookup, subnet calculator, and map port scan and this option right here is something that we are not going to run right now. Since this is something that we cover in the scanning section, the subdomain scanner is also something that we are not going to be doing right now. These options as well, so these are just some of the advanced options that we are going to cover later on, so we won't be running them at the moment. We can go with, for example, DNS lookup to check out which DNS servers it has, and here is the output. So this tool seems to be pretty good. It does give us some of the information for Google. Now of course there are other options that we didn't run and that I would advise you not to run since some of them can be considered advanced scanning methods, but nonetheless we will be covering them in the next section. So for now on what we did is we managed to find the random tool on GitHub, install it and get it to work. We also tested it out and it did give us some of the information. Now what I want you to do for the next video is try to download the same way a tool called Sherlock. It is also a tool from GitHub, we saw it up here. If I go one step back to this page, the first tool that we saw was, I believe, called Sherlock. Try to download this tool. It is a tool that is used to discover different accounts on different platforms based on the usernames that you specify. Try it out and we will see how to download it and run it in the next video. Have you managed to download the Sherlock tool? If you did, congrats! If not, let's see how we can get it and what we can do with it. So if you haven't already, open up your Firefox and type Sherlock GitHub. The first link should be at the original link of the tool that should lead you to this GitHub page. Once you're on the Sherlock page, you should see all of the files that belong to this tool. Down here, we will see the installation, so how we can install the tool. And right here we will also see the usage. But before we check out the usage of the tool, let us go and download Sherlock first. So we already know how we can do that, just copy the link to this tool, open up your terminal, and type git clone, and then paste the link of the tool. 
press enter and this should automatically download the tool for us. We can see this tool is a lot larger than the Red Hawk since it took a little bit more time to download. And once it finishes downloading we should type ls and we will see the Sherlock folder inside of our desktop directory. Let us navigate to that folder. And if I type ls in it, we should see all of these files that we saw on this page right here. Good. Let us close this. We are not going to be checking anything on this page anymore. And outside of all of these files, we want to go to this Sherlock folder. So if I go cd Sherlock and type ls right here, here is the tool. It is a Python tool and we know that this is the tool since it is named Sherlock.py. All these other Python files are simply just the additional files for this tool that is probably getting imported inside of this. So to run this we can type the command python3 and then Sherlock. Hmm, no module named to request. So this could either mean one of two things. This tool is supposed to be ran with Python 2 or this module does not exist for Python 3. And if you get an error that some module doesn't exist, what you want to do is you want to type pip3 install and then the name of the module. So I can just copy this, copy selection and paste it right here. Let's see whether we can download this module. And it seems that the requirement has already been satisfied, so it could be that we're missing this module for Python 2. Let's try first to run it once again, after running this command. So this command actually did something. As it says, it performed building of wheels for collected packages, and it managed to resolve our problem. So now we can run the tool. It does give us an error right here, but this is just a syntax error that tells us that some arguments are required, such as usernames. So let me just clear the screen and type python3 sherlock.py once again. And here are all of the available options that we can use with Sherlock. But the basic usage of this tool is specifying python3 sherlock.py and then after it comes a username. What this tool will do with that username is it is going to search through a bunch of different platforms for the same username. So if you for example had a username that you discovered for some domain or for some company and you wanted to discover whether that person has some other accounts with the same username, you can throw it in this tool and it will find you all the other accounts that have that same username. So what are we going to use here? Well, do you remember our harvester tool? It didn't work once we tried it out, but what I did a few minutes ago is I ran the command on the same domain that didn't work previously once we tried it before. I also put the source to be Twitter, so it managed to find 10 users that have Twitter, and these users are discovered from this domain. If I go and copy any one of them, and let's go with keyframes, and throw it in this tool, I should be able to discover other accounts that have this same username. So here we already got this one. And by the way, this is not really a unique username, so it might be that this account, for example, doesn't belong to the same person. But if you were to find a unique username, such as, for example, maybe this one, or this one, or even this one, and throw it inside of this tool, and you manage to discover some other accounts, those accounts will probably belong to that person. But if the username was something like media, and we put media inside of the Sherlock tool, well then most likely all of those accounts will not belong to the same person. Okay, so here is our output, and it managed to discover a bunch of other accounts that also have the same username. So let's try with another username. If I go all the way down and control C this, then clear the screen and let's pick for example this username, copy it and I throw it inside of this tool once again. Let us see whether we manage to find another platform that has this same account. 
so it seems that most of them are giving us not found. Let's wait for final results. And here they are. So we already get the output for Wikipedia. We got our username that we discovered from the Twitter profile. If I go all the way up, let's see whether we managed to find something else. And it seems that all of the others have not found. And here is also a Cache Me profile with the same username. So that is another result that we managed to gather. Okay, great. So that would basically be it for this tool. Now, another thing that this tool does is it also saves our results in a file. So if I go and control C this, clear the screen and type LS. Oh, never mind. It seems that it didn't save it. Maybe if we specified an option for it to save, let us run the help menu. No such far or directory. Yeah, that's because we are in a wrong folder. So let me go to the Sherlock folder and run the Python 3 Sherlock.py dash dash help. And yeah, we actually probably had to run this output command. And after the output, we specify the file name and the output of the result will be saved to this file. So it doesn't save it by default. And you can also check out other options as well. But the purpose of this and previous video was to figure out how we can download additional tools. You might never use this tool again, or you might use it every time. It depends on which type of penetration tests you perform and what kind of strategy you plan for your attacks. But it is always good to have a bunch of different tools and options that you can use. All right, so now that we know how we can download tools from GitHub, every time a certain tool breaks or you don't get the desired result with some tool, you can go to GitHub and try to find a similar tool that will give you better results. Okay, good. So in the next video, I will give you a bonus tool that I created in Python 3 that will be able to gather much more emails than the already built-in tools in Cal Linux. Welcome back. And in this bonus video, we're going to be covering the tool that I created in Python 3 that is used to gather emails. Now, even though later in the course we will be coding some of our own Python tools, this is one that we will not code, so we will just see how it works. I will explain how it works, of course, and we are going to see how many emails it can gather. So, this is the tool right here, called Email Scraper, and you will have this to download in the resources of this lecture. But let me show you how you can transfer it on the Kali Linux desktop. If you go up here on the devices, and you go on drag and drop and click on bidirectional. Then anything that you have on your desktop, since I had the program right here, if you go and drag it to your Cal Linux machine, it will get moved onto your Cal Linux desktop. As you can see right here, this folder already contains this file since I already have it on my desktop, so I'll just skip this. But you, after setting this to bidirectional, can transfer any file from your host desktop to your Cal Linux desktop. Okay, good. Now that we know how we can transfer it, let us see what this tool is and how we can run it. So just to check out the code of this tool real quick, let us double click on it and let me enlarge all of this. And what this tool essentially does is it asks us for the URL and we provide it with the URL of a certain domain name. Then what this tool does is it tries to extract all of the emails that are in the HTML page of the URL that you specified. But what it also does is it tries to crawl within other URLs that are found inside of that page. For example, this count variable right here, that is equal to 100, means that we will be searching for emails in 100 different links. So you specify the main URL, then it goes through that URL, it extracts all of the emails, but it also extracts all of the other URLs that are leading to different pages. Then it goes to those different pages and performs the same thing. It tries to find the emails and it also finds more URLs. And it does that until it reaches 100 URLs. This is a number that you can change if you want to. So you can set this to be lower or higher depending on how much results you want to find. And down here we can see that it is finding those emails using regex. So this is the pattern that we are searching for. And don't worry if you don't understand any of this. Regex is just a way for us to find certain patterns in a lot of text. So for example, this is a pattern that will allow us to find emails. 
in the HTML code of the page. And then we, at the end of this, print all of the emails that we found. So that is the basic principle behind this tool. Let us see how it runs and whether we manage to find more emails than we did with Hunter.io and the Harvester. So let's close this, go to our terminal, find where you have this file downloaded and I have it on my desktop. And to just run it, we can type Python 3 and then the name of the file. It will tell us enter target URL to scan and here I'm going to specify the full URL to the same domain name that we used for the harvester and hunter.io just so we can compare how many results we get with this tool and how many results we got with hunter.io and the harvester. So if I type the domain name and press here enter, this will go and process 100 links. And depending on whether you change that number, it might be higher or lower. And at the end of processing these links, it will print out all of the emails that it managed to find. So if you remember, with hunter.io, the website that we used, with the free account we managed to gather 10 different emails. With the harvester, first time we didn't manage to get any email, but after running it a couple of times, we might be able to get around 10 to 15 different emails with the harvester. But let's see how many this tool will find. So let's just wait for this to finish and I will get back to you as soon as it's done. Okay, so the tool has finished scanning and here are all of the emails that we managed to find. You can see there is at least 100 or 150 of them and they all belong to the same domain. Now, we might occasionally find some email that doesn't belong to this domain and we saw one down here, I believe. Let me just find it. This one. It doesn't have the domain name inside of the email, but all of the others do. And we got at least 5 to 10 times more results than we managed to get with the Harvester, which is Cal Linux tool, or with the free account of Hunter.io. And here are all the links that it processed, so it clicked on all of these links and it tried to extract as much emails as it could from these links. Cool, right? So now you have a tool that will be able to capture a lot of emails based on the specified domain. Just make sure that once you run the tool, you specify HTTP or HTTPS before the domain name. Okay, so this tool is now yours. Feel free to use it as much as you want. And later on in the course, we will also be coding our own Python tools. They will not be some too advanced tools, but we will be covering basics of creating our own hacking tools which is something that every hacker should at some point of their journey learn. Great, so now that we finished with the information gathering section, we are ready to start off with scanning section. And you might be wondering how are you going to be able to follow the scanning section and all the other sections since you don't really have permission to scan any website. Don't worry, there are a lot of free vulnerable machines and websites that we can download and practice on them. And we're going to be seeing how we can find them and install them inside of our virtual box. So we will have our own vulnerable lab where we can practice our hacking. So thank you for watching this section and I will see you in the next one.